you. Thank you very much for inviting me. So we are moving away from electrical problems to structural problems. My topic is heart failure. I'll start with a case I saw a few weeks ago. He's a 57-year-old male presented with effort breathlessness for six weeks with bilateral leg swelling. And the only previous history was he is a hypertensive for the last four years and is a non-smoker with moderate alcohol intake. On examination, there was no cyanosis, anemia, or clubbing, and bilateral painless pitting edema. Pulse was 110 and regular. Blood pressure 145 over 96. Raised JVP about 3 centimeter. Normal heart sounds. Increased respiratory rate. Scattered wheeze, but no crackles. Right apocondial tenderness with hepatomic galley. So what is the cause of breathlessness? This is a question. So you can answer now. So is it left heart failure, late onset bronchial asthma, chest infection, right heart failure, or congestive heart failure? Right, OK. So you all know. So we'll go on to the heart failure proper. The definition and different types of heart failure, the pathophysiology of heart failure, which is relevant for clinical management, the causes of different types of heart failure, when to suspect heart failure, and how do we manage. This is a US data of 2004 showing that there is going to be an epidemic of heart failure, if not already. And this will go on for another 25 years. The same data is true for Europe and all over the world. This, is show, this slide shows the annual mortality of heart failure, how deadly it is. The disease mortality related to the severity of heart failure. As you can see, the advanced heart failure, what we call a stage four heart failure, has an annual mortality of around 30 to 80%. The good news is it is coming down, thanks to you all. And the mechanism of death of all heart failure 40% die sudden arrhythmic death, about which you have already heard, or due to worsening of heart failure, which is very disabling, and 20% of them die of unrelated condition like MI or pneumonia. This is a slide done by Stuart and colleagues to show how bad the quality of life of heart failure patients. They took into consideration six chronic diseases, angina, diabetes, arthritis, chronic lung disease. And as you can see, the self-assessment questionnaire study, the heart failure persons, they felt that the quality of life is much worse. Hypertensive always feel better than normal people. So what is the definition of heart failure? This is very important. It's a clinical syndrome due to failure of the heart to maintain adequate cardiac output secondary to a structural defect of the heart. The most common structural defect is a ventricular dysfunction, and the second most common is valve malfunction. There are two uncommon structural defects. They are congenital shunts like ASD, VSD, or pericardial disease like constitutive pericarditis can mimic right heart failure. So the ventricular dysfunction, there are two main functional types. Pure diastolic dysfunction with a normal contraction. It is also known as heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. And the other type is systolic dysfunction where there is weakness of the contraction known as heart failure with low ejection fraction. Uh, please remind that all systolic dysfunction have some degree of diastolic dysfunction. Which one is better to have? This is a Canadian study on 2,800 patients. They followed these patients for a year, and the blue is systolic heart failure, and the yellow is diastolic heart failure. You can see they are equally bad. So what happens in the body when the heart fails to maintain adequate cardiac output? There is activation of neurohormonal system with a view to divert the blood flow to the brain. In the heart, there is high intracardiac pressure. As a result, there is dilatation or hypertrophy of all the chambers, as well as ongoing myocardial fibrosis, as well as programmed cell death. So it's a rapidly progressive disease, unless we diagnose early and treat. 
the two most important activation in the body in heart failure are the sympathetic activation, which causes severe vasoconstriction, and also sinus tachycardia. The second most important is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which produces large amount of angiotensin II, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor, and also it stimulates aldosterone to secrete more salt and water. So if someone asks you in one sentence, how do you describe what happens in heart failure, there is an increase in preload and increase in afterload. Why does the body do this? The main reason is to maintain cardiac output. So it increases the stroke volume, increases the heart rate, and increases the peripheral resistance. This is just to say the heart likes the brain, hates every other organ, including skin, muscles, planning vessels, and the kidney. There's only one neuromonal activation which is good, and that is natriuretic peptide. The atria secrete the atrial natriuretic peptide, and the ventricles secrete the brain natriuretic peptides. They are vasodilators as well as cause certain amount of diuresis. But one against two is not a match. So what are the types of heart failure? Anatomically, it is left heart failure, right heart failure, and congestive heart failure, which is a biventricular failure. Each type can be acute or chronic and systolic or diastolic. So we will stick to the left heart failure for the rest of the talk. And there are four main causes of left heart failure. Coronary artery disease, hypertension, valvular disease, and cardiomyopathy. The one, two, and four causes myocardial dysfunction and the valvular disease initially cause mechanical cause of heart failure. And the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and restricted cardiomyopathy causes predominantly diastole heart failure and hypertensive, they start with diastole heart failure and then they go on to cause systole heart failure if you ignore that. These are some of the common causes of dilated cardiomyopathy, alcohol or any drug abuse, connective tissue diseases, endocrine causes like thyroid or diabetes. It can be very familial, 10 to 20 percent. It can be due to rare infiltration and commonly due to viral infection and pregnancy. So if a young patient comes to you with breathlessness, please do not ignore. What are the causes of right heart failure? The most important thing for us to remember is the left heart failure is the single most common cause of right heart failure. So when your patient develops bilateral ankle edema, you should start worrying. There are other rare causes of pure right heart failure, like COPD and pulmonary embolism, as well as idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. So when to suspect heart failure, i.e., what are the main symptoms? Breathlessness and tiredness are the main symptoms. Initially, they are mainly on exertion, and then they progress to breathlessness at rest. They may have difficulty in lying flat, or they may get up in the middle of the night with cough and wheeze, which is more due to left heart failure than due to bronchial asthma. So we grade the heart failure according to the degree of breathlessness. The grade one and two are mild, which has minimal limitation, but grade three means they have difficulty in doing their day-to-day -day task, and grade four means patients are unable to get out of bed because of breathlessness at rest like orthopnea. Those patients should be managed ideally in the hospital. What are the signs of left heart failure? They are common in acute heart failure, but you do get in chronic heart failure like our patient. Increased respiratory rate, increased heart rate, sweating, cyanosis, cold extremities. The blood pressure can be high, normal, or low. If it is low, you have to worry. And further signs of left heart failure are displaced apex, additional heart sounds, murmurs, crackles. Please don't ignore the crackles. And also never ignore the wheeze because that may be the only sign of left heart failure. The symptoms of right heart failure, on top of that, you get peripheral edema, abdominal distension, and GI symptoms. We have come across few right heart failure patients managed by the surgeons initially, and then the ECG showed the diagnosis. The signs of right heart failure are the raised JVP, so it's worth looking at the neck as well as the feet, 
and also fill the abdomen for any tenderness in the liver area. So the three pearls of the signs of heart failure is crackles almost invariably dictates fluid load, and clear lung field doesn't say a patient hasn't got fluid load, and examination of the neck is the best specific sign that the patient has fluid load. So what do we do? What is the best investigation for heart failure? 12 ECG. If the ECG is normal, it is extremely unlikely that the patient has heart failure. You can do a blood test for heart failure, either BNP or NT pro BNP. If it is raised, then it is highly suggestive of heart failure. And the chest X-ray can be normal in 50% of patients. But if you do all these three, and if all these three are normal, patient hasn't got heart failure. But if any one of them is abnormal, then you proceed with an echocardiography. Once you have confirmed heart failure, you do blood tests for management, which include full blood count, renal function, thyroid function, as well as other appropriate tests. Coronary angiography and further sophisticated imaging are only for specific cases to identify the cause, not to identify heart failure. Myocardial biopsy has been done very rarely in heart failure. So to summarize the investigation of uh, heart failure, the ESC guidelines, the European Society of Cardiology recommended ECG, X-ray, and BMP. If any one of them abnormal, go ahead with echocardiography. And this is an ECG of a breathless patient you can see there are Q waves anteriorly, so the cause of this patient heart failure, without any further imaging, you know, is due to ischemic heart disease. And this patient has got severe left ventricular hypertrophy due to deep S wave, so the cause of this patient heart failure is diastole heart failure caused by hypertension. What is the role of echocardiography? It is still the gold standard investigation for heart failure, a normal echo, no heart failure. Differ it also helps to differentiate, in fact, this is the best test to differentiate systolic and diastolic dysfunction. You can never clinically differentiate that. It also quantifies the degree of systolic dysfunction by giving you the degree of ejection fraction. It quantifies the degree of diastolic dysfunction from grade one to grade four. Grade three and four diastolic dysfunction, you have to worry, and also it's identified the cause of heart failure in majority of patients. This is a still picture of a two-dimensional echocardiography. The transducer is here. So this is left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium, and left atrium. So this is a dynamic picture, and we can say that the left ventricle is not happy, is not contracting well. So this patient has got systolic heart failure of the left ventricle the commonest cause of which is ischemic heart disease. So how do we manage? We know how do we diagnose, so how do we manage? The main management here is left heart failure, mainly systolic heart failure. We have non-pharmacological, pharmacological way, surgical, device therapy, and transplant. The non-pharmacological way, avoid alcohol, smoking, stress. I'm just trying to get A, B, C, D, E, F. Bed rest during acute exacerbation, counseling of the patient and the fam family because it's distressing condition, diet low in salt, exercise in group and supervised, as well as fully restriction, particularly in right heart failure. So how do we pharmacologically manage and make the patient live longer? It is straightforward because the two harmful system is angiotensin activation and sympathetic activation. We block both of them. On top of that, we will put device therapy to improve the prognosis. And what drugs we use? Furosemide is very important because as we have seen, there is significant amount of fluid retention, so you get the patient out of the fluid retention. Sometimes you have to add metallosone on top of furosemide to manage the patient symptomatically. And then you use ACE inhibitors, which are the best renin blockers for prognostic reason. If they can't use that, you can use angiotensin receptor blocker. But you never use a combination in heart failure. There is no evidence. On top of that, you must use anti-aldosterone if there is no contraindication. 
and spironolactone or epileronone both have evidence. The beta blockers, there are four beta blockers have been shown to be beneficial, bisoprolol, cavadilol, metoprolol, or nebivalol. That's your choice. So how do they work, beta blockers? They improve the symptom as well as in uh, prognosis. You always start low with the do lowest possible dosage and uptright rate slowly because there is a reason for that. And you don't reach the maximum dose. You aim for the heart rate of 55 to 60 because there is a lot of individual variation. Once you reach that, even if it is 1.25, that is good enough. The beta blockers reduce sudden cardiac death, improve the left ventricular cavity size and ejection fraction. They reduce onset of atrial fibrillation and VT, and there are enough evidence more than rocket science. And spironolactone is very useful as long as you stick to the contraindication, advanced renal disease, you should not use, and you must closely monitor the potassium. In young patients, or if the patient develop any anti androgen side effect, switch to epilerinol. And digoxin has no prognostic benefit whatsoever. It's a cardiac tonic. And you can use it to improve the symptoms or control the AF rate. The device therapy is intracardiac defibrillator, implantable cardio defibrillator. All heart failure patients, you should consider whether the patient needs defibrillator for saving life. So there are very clear guidelines. Most of them are ECG based as well as the degree of symptoms. And also all the heart failure patients above grade two, you should consider the option of biventricular pacing to improve the symptoms and prognosis. Roughly one third of your heart failure patients uh, will benefit by that. And why ICD? Because ventricular arrhythmias are at least six times more common in heart failure patients. So you can prevent when the death by implantable defibrillator. And as I mentioned, the criteria is ejection fraction below 35 and the QRS, wider QRS patients benefit. Once you have offered the maximum pharmacological therapy, consider the option of device therapy if the patient is still feeling bad. Of course, all these patients should be considered for heart transplant and there are specific criteria and if they are suitable for heart transplant, as a bridging process, they can be offered left ventricular assist device. Currently, three of our patients are on that. So in summary, heart failure is common and the prevalence is increasing. The main cause of systolic heart failure is coronary artery disease and diastolic heart failure is hypertension. The burden of heart failure is the disabling symptom, activity limitation, arrhythmias, frequent hospitalizations, and high mortality. The pharmacological treatment and device therapy have been shown to improve the outcome only in systole heart failure, but not in diastole heart failure. Patients with advanced heart failure and their families should be offered supportive care or palliative care, the term they don't like. So success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. My final question, which of the following statements about ventricular dysfunction is not true? Systolic and diastolic dysfunction can coexist. Yes, that's true. High BP is the commonest cause of diastolic dysfunction. Valvular disease can cause either systolic or diastolic dysfunction. Yes. And diastolic heart failure have a better survival rate than systolic heart failure. That's absolutely wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you.